everyone. I'm Deandra Rose. I'm a professor at the Duke University School of Public Policy and the Director of Research for Polis, the Center for Politics. And I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event. Here at Polis, we work to increase our understanding of politics by promoting cutting edge research. We work to foster rich political discussions and we work to help a new generation of leaders find on ramps to public service. This evening, it's our distinct honor to have Professor Kathy Schwartz and Professor Gavin Yamey with us for a discussion of funding the battle against COVID-19. This event is part of the Polis Innovation Accelerator, which works to help students produce bold solutions for some of our most pressing political problems. So right now, before we get started with tonight's conversation, I'm going to turn it over to Morena Martinez, our Paulus PhD fellow, who really has done an amazing job helping to organize this series to say a few words about the Innovation Accelerator. So Morena. Thank you so much, Professor Rose. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Each year, the Innovation Accelerator will offer speakers events and workshops centered around a particular theme. The goal is to encourage people to think up bold policy solutions to today's biggest political problems. This year's theme is justice and citizenship in a, in a time of COVID. Last semester, we hosted illuminating conversations with experts on structural inequality, mail-in voting, and leadership. We're pleased to continue these conversations this semester with talks on topics like education during and after COVID-19 and the future of the US healthcare system. We're also very excited to announce that we'll be hosting our very first policy solutions competition this semester. It's going to give undergraduate and graduate students the opportunity to compete for prizes by crafting innovative policy proposals to address challenges related to racial justice, the COVID-19 pandemic, science and technology policy, and voter participation. Stick around after today's discussion for more information on how you can get involved in this competition. And Professor Rose. Thanks so much, Morena. So for more information on the policy pitch competition, upcoming policy events and videos of our previous events, please do take a moment and visit our website, which is policy.duke.edu. So for tonight, we hope that as you're listening to what I know will be an amazing discussion, we hope that you'll be thinking about any questions that you would like to pose to our guests. And if you could enter them in the chat box at any time during the conversation, um, send them to me or to Morena Martinez. Uh, we will make sure to try to get to them, get to as many as we can and um, during our Q&A segment later in the hour. So to kick things off, I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for the evening, the Director of Polis, Professor Mac McCorkle. Pope Mac McCorkle has served as an issues consultant to political candidates, state governments, and various organizations for the last two decades. Since starting McCorkle Policy Consulting in 1994, Mac has worked for state and federal candidates in North Carolina, as well as 28 other states. Professor McCorkle has published a number of articles on politics and public policy in academic journals and such magazines as Columbia Journalism Review, Commonwealth and Society. He graduated from Princeton Magna Cum Laude in history and Duke Law School with honors. He clerked on the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and practiced law for a number of years in Raleigh with the firm founded by former Duke University president and Sanford School namesake, Terry Sanford. So Professor McCorkle. Thank you, Deandra. Uh, um, thank you for all the people being here. I've been looking forward to this, not just as a moderator, but as part of the audience, because we have two excellent Duke experts on the COVID crisis and, and beyond. Uh, so let me introduce those. Our first expert is Catherine Schwartz. Catherine Schwartz is a professor of health economics and policy at the Harvard School of Public Health and is a visiting professor at Duke University Sanford School of Public Policy. Professor Schwartz was president of the Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management in 2009 and is a member of the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Social, Insur Social Insurance. She received her PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin in 1976 and her BS in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1972. Her research interests have focused on people without health insurance how regulations of insurance markets might work to increase 
access to health insurance, and more recently on policy issues related to the elderly and has taught a court cost course in the master's program on that subject. I've known Professor Schwartz by her reputation ever since I read her incredible book, Reinsuring Health, Why More People, uh, Why More Middle Class People Are Uninsured and What Government Can Do About It in 2006, which really was an incredibly influential book in the Obamacare thinking, she really laid out a stronger version of Obamacare than was ever uh, instituted, but was quite uh, influential in that thinking. So Kathy may be our mainly our domestic policy expert, even though she's gonna be free to roam beyond the domestic policy front. Our second Duke expert is Gavin Yamey, who is a professor of global health and public policy at Duke University and the center, director of the Center for Public Policy Impact in Global Health, based in the Duke Global Health Institute. Uh, he trained in clinical medicine at Harvard, at Oxford University and University of Sh College London, medical journalism and editing at the BMJ, I guess that's British Medical Journal, I don't know, and public yep. London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. In 2009, he was awarded a Kaiser Family Mini, Medi, mini media fellowship in global health reporting to examine the barriers to scaling up low cost uh, and health, low cost, low tech health tools in Sudan, Uganda, and Kenya. He's an advisor to the WHO uh, and is a quite a, a prolific commentator these days on Twitter, national Public radio, and where I reach him in a very old fashioned way. Time Magazine. I'm glad that we still have columnists who are writing for Time, Time Magazine. And uh, Gavin will cover uh, the global front force, but again, he'll be free to roam where he, where he wants to. Uh, let me just start off, and I'll start with Kathy, and, but ask the same question to, to Gavin, again, especially on the domestic front, Kathy. Can you help us get our heads around the, the cost of COVID, the damage that COVID's done? To our healthcare policy, to healthcare, to our, our society, to our economy. How would you just briefly summarize the damage, the cost of COVID? Asking anybody to do this briefly is uh, yeah. <laughs> um, that seconds. Yeah, no. Right. Um, I think it's very difficult to get our heads around us. Um, the numbers begin to feel like um, we're talking about monopoly money almost, you know, that it's just they're huge. When we talk now that there are 400 and closing on 430,000 people who have died today by today in the United States, um, or to put that closer home, almost 9,000 here in North Carolina. Um, you know, and my heart breaks for people like this. Um, I've had one friend die and um, another friend's daughter got very, very sick. So it's, it's frightening as one part of the damage. Um, but beyond that, I think beyond deaths, which are horrible enough, and we really can't put much value on that, it's impossible. Um, there are clearly jobs that have been lost in this um, just between when the pandemic really started and we closed down everything last March through June, for example. Um, there was a net loss of about 15 million jobs. There were actually 20 some odd million people who lost their jobs, but um, about five and a half million new jobs got created. So if you think about Amazon delivering or uh, more people needed in warehouse stocking, that kind of thing. Um, and along with those job losses, we had about 15 million, we're not really sure yet how many other beyond that 15 million um, lost access to employer sponsored or union sponsored health insurance. So in that 15 million that I'm talking about, it's both the people who lost jobs that had employer sponsored health insurance as one of the benefits, but all their dependents, their spouses, children. Um, so that's another big number just to, you know, 15 million. That's basically half the number of people who already did not have health insurance. Now we're, we're adding on to that. And then of course there are businesses. There are many, many small businesses, restaurants, um, hair salons, um, you just name it, small hardware stores that are really suffering from all this. And the hope is that they'll all be able to come back once we get through this. Um, you know, I think in terms of costs, medical costs, 
we don't know yet what those costs are. Um, you know, we know, for example, that this testing, which we have not done enough of, has been um, expensive and it's just, we're not doing enough of that. The second part is um, the healthcare costs of taking care of people with COVID in the hospitals. We don't yet know what that is. Um, there are going to be indirect costs of people who did not go seek medical care that we were going to have to start adding in. And of course, right now, what we're really seeing is the distribution problems and the costs of getting files, for example, um, that we just people we were not prepared. We were not prepared for. Um, I think there are a lot of other indirect costs that I'm just going to rattle off and because I want to point them out. Um, you know, aside from those losses of jobs, the jobs really were particularly hard hitting for women. And once you have women or anybody who's lost their job, they are not paying money into Social Security or Medicare or their pensions. So or 401k per plan. So this is going to come later as being a real cost for them. Um, there are clearly education losses. We've got lots of kids who have not been in school. And then now we're hearing much more about mental health problems, not only of kids and teenagers and college kids, but any age group. Um, I think these are exacerbating racial and ethnic inequalities. Those are big costs that we're not, you know, how do you put a dollar value on that? Um, and then of course, life expectancy, which we had been climbing up this is now going to lower our life expectancy, which has implications for any of the forecasting that we're doing about future costs for Medicare and Social Security. Um, a lot of these, we just simply cannot put a dollar value on. And the last cost that I'd like to at least put out on the table is um, the loss of trust in government, the loss of trust in government to be able to do the vaccinations in a competent way and let us know when things are coming. Um, and I think the what clearly happened over the last couple of years was the loss of trust in science. So that when anybody like Dr. Fauci starts talking about what we need to do, there are a lot of people who are just dismissing it. And I think it's gonna take a long time for that to come back, but it's this loss of trust in sort of civil society that I think is, is another factor to take into account here. Thank you, Kathy. That's, that, that's a pretty good way to get, get our heads at least started around, around the topic. Uh, Gavin, take it from the same question, but maybe look a little bit more globally if you want to, but also go sure. with Sure. So obviously when you look at the numbers globally, you know, everything that uh, Kathy said just becomes multiplied. The World Economic Forum estimates the economic losses are going to be somewhere between eight and sixteen trillion dollars. The IMF estimates higher, twenty-six trillion dollars. Um, and of course, as someone who's a, a physician and public health professor first and foremost, not an economist, our team had done a lot of work before this pandemic on how little it would have cost to set up a proper pandemic preparedness system. We estimate that for about $10 billion a year, um, we could have had a, 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 you know, a functional global preparedness system fit for purpose, peanuts compared to these trillions of dollars in losses. I would like to say just a couple of other things. And that is the first law of virus economics is that you control the virus. And we have seen, and I hope we come back to this, this ridiculous, bizarre notion that you can either have an opening up of the economy and economic growth or you control the virus. We heard this narrative very profoundly in two of the countries that did the worst in controlling the virus. I'm a citizen of both the USA and the UK. You know, horrific public policy responses, probably the worst public policy failures in modern history, both in the US and the UK, they've ended up with awful, uh, you know, health consequences and economic consequences. And if you look at the nations that act trusted science, listened to the WHO, who on January the 23rd last year told every nation on earth to get ready for transmission, to test aggressively, to isolate, to quarantine, to financially support those who are isolating and quarantining. 
to financially support those if you do uh, institute a stay at home order, support people to stay at home. Those nations that acted fast, aggressively, adopted science, had leadership, um, and actually instituted aggressive public health measures, test and trace, social distancing, hand washing, masking, high filtration masks very early on, as you know, Taiwan distributed high filtration masks. Not only have they had very few deaths, not only have they returned to near normal life, I have friends in China, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand sending me photos of essentially life back to normal, schools open, workplaces open, clubs open, I love clubbing, I miss going to nightclubs. Um, and they are now economically growing. You've seen the figures for China, you've seen the figures for New Zealand. So you see this extraordinary divergence, nations that turned inwards, uh, UK, US, Brazil, uh, India, Russia, populist strongmen, anti-science, bizarre theories about ingesting bleach, uh, have had horrific outcomes health outcomes and also horrific uh, economic outcomes. The first law of virus economics, control the virus. Gotcha. Gavin, let me go back to you. I mean, both of y'all are public health professors uh, and one, and I'm sure Kathy will have some commentary on this, but one of the columns of yours that, that I remember vividly as I was putting together my uh, course for uh, my 803 policy course introduction for master's students was the ironic column that you wrote in Time, co-authored co in Time, saying, and you've already mentioned this, but go into it more depth. The US and UK would have seemed to have been the most best prepared for the pandemic and weren't. Why? Yes. So, you know, there was a lot of pandemic forecasting and pandemic metrics. There was a whole science of kind of pandemic preparedness metrics. This arose out of Ebola, the 2014 to 2016 Ebola epidemic in West Africa. After Ebola, the world decided never again, right? You know, we heard this, you know, get our systems in place and we're gonna score every country. We're gonna look at how well prepared they are. And the US and UK were number one and number two. They were on paper, the best prepared countries on earth to deal with a pandemic based on, you know, a whole variety of institutional, scientific and public health capabilities. The one thing that they forgot, of course, in those metrics was the political economy, the political leadership, the style of leadership. They didn't know that there would be a conservative, uh, you know, a Brexiteer um, and a Trump uh, who would, you know, turn inwards, reject science. Um, and it's very sadly, both formally adopting the notion of herd immunity by natural infection. So both countries, as did Sweden, decided early on that actually letting the virus rip would somehow be the right policy, which of course was anti-science, you know, uh, uh, mumbo jumbo, unethical, dystopian and inhumane. Um, and so I think as we go forward, there's going to be a million analyses of what went wrong, and there's going to be a huge a need for political economy research to figure out how do you not just get prepared scientifically? Of course, there's a set of public health capabilities that we all now need, every single country, from surveillance to operational research to contact tracing. But there's a, there's a leadership uh, trust, as Cathy said earlier, trust in science, trust in leadership uh, component that is equally as important. Gotcha. So we had, on paper, we had the two best prepared countries and the two leaders of those countries both came down with COVID. Um, dangerously so so yes indeed pick up on on what gavin was saying was it a uh, was it a deficiency in our public health infrastructure something more or is our public health infrastructure now damaged in in the united states so uh, significantly by what's gone on or do we have hope for the future so, so i would just add to um <laughs> so first of all lack of trust is not just that it was uh, Johnson and Trump. This actually goes back decades in the United States, at least, that the public health infrastructure that we have has been whittled away in terms of financial support, I would say going back at least to 1980. And if you just start looking at decade after decade, 
I think that Congress deserves a lot of blame here as well, that it was easier to sort of say, we don't need more money for that, or we're gonna make the states and local governments pay for this rather than have federal support for it. So, you know, the, this has been going on for, for four decades, at least now. Um, and just to give you some simple examples of this, um, I did a project where I was talking with community health leaders in eight counties, two counties in each of four states. And I started actually in North Carolina and the public health department person I talked to first made me realize that I needed to talk with every one of these counties, departments of public health. And I tried very hard to figure out how much money each of them had from different sources. And I was unable to do that. Um, and the News and Observer, I don't know how many people have read that this week, but um, I think it was Monday, had a terrific piece about their going to every one of the counties here in North Carolina and asking them for their budget and how, how they've gotten money. And basically they got back from a little over half of the counties, the kinds of details they'd asked for. It is almost impossible to figure out how much money they get. And in particular, most counties are heavily reliant on local tax revenues, either property taxes or some portion of the state, state sales tax. Those are, again, are very easy for people to say, mm -hmm. cut those, we don't need them. And yet we have put more demands on our public health infrastructure over these last four decades anyway. So, you know, can we rebuild it? I absolutely think we have to rebuild it. And, um, you know, Biden's proposal um, of the almost $2 trillion includes $350 billion in aid for state and local governments. I think that's a down payment. That's not gonna possibly get us back to what is needed in terms of rebuilding. And part of the rollout problems we're having right now in terms of getting vaccinations is really, you can directly link that back to the public health infrastructure, which has been, in my mind, decimated. Gotcha. I want to come back to, to the vaccination question uh, towards the end of the discussion. Let me stay with Kathy and ask you both about where you think the, the future of healthcare insurance or coverage uh, is going in light of COVID or maybe not going anywhere at all. But Kathy, especially it, it, in the domestic arena here in the United States, we have the issue of employer provided insurance being critically damaged by the COVID crisis. Is that an opportunity for change? Does it just mean that we're, we're going to have, as you suggest, way more uninsurance or underinsurance? What, what, but are there any opportunities here? I think that's a great question, Mac, and it's one that I've been um, toying with in my head for weeks now, months. Um, you know, we, before the pandemic really started, we were at the point of just over half of the American population had health insurance through an employer or union sponsored plan. And a little over a third of all Americans are covered by public insurance through either Medicare or Medicaid. And um, the Affordable Care Act, which a lot of people call Obamacare, but the Affordable Care Act marketplaces were a place that people who did not have employer-sponsored health insurance were able to buy with a subsidy um, private insurance through these marketplaces. One of the problems from the get-go when that legislation passed was that there was a realization by the people who designed it that they would need to raise the income ceiling for eligibility for the subsidies and Congress refused to do that. So Congress also did some other things in terms of what the Biden administration is now going to try and roll back. But it really does all of this beg the question of maybe it's time to really think much more strongly about what kind of health insurance the United States ought to have. The inequities that have been highlighted by COVID and I think it's related to who is willing to come forward now to get vaccinated. That the word is out there that you need to show or they'll ask you about your insurance coverage. 
And a lot of people don't have health insurance. Um, everybody's been told for the last year that the shots will be free. So, you know, it just brings it up again, the inequities here. So personally, I really hope this does open up a discussion. I don't expect that discussion to take place until sometime after we get through the initial fix, as Gavin said, get everybody vaccinated and get this pandemic under control. Gotcha. Gavin, same question, future of healthcare insurance or coverage. I know, you know, obviously they, other nations may not be as Im impacted as we are, but do you see yeah. changes coming? I mean, so, uh, you know, the future of healthcare and healthcare insurance for the whole world is hard to capture um, uh, very quickly. But what I would say is, you know, in global health, the three most important words, the guidepost, the lodestar, if you like, is universal health coverage. All nations have formally said they are going for UHC, uh, defined as having access to quality services when you need them without financial impoverishment. And that part's really important. Actually, my first love was the British National Health System before my wife. Um, and uh, in Britain, when the NHS was launched in 1948, a leaflet was placed underneath every single person's door. And on the front of the leaflet, it says, this is your National Health Service. It will ease your financial worries when you are sick. And I think we sometimes forget that that's ultimately, of course, uh, you know, being, being ill is incredibly stressful, but then thinking you're gonna be bankrupt if you go and get healthcare, you know, it's immoral that people would have that additional stress. All nations are going for universal health coverage. The COVID-19 pandemic has simply shown how and why reaching that is so important. And I would say that, you know, I try and be optimistic. It's quite hard right now, but one silver lining from this horrific pandemic, the worst in a hundred years, is that health is now high up on the agenda of every single nation in the way that it wasn't before. Health, as you all know, is typically low politics, very low politics. The Minister of Health, she is the lowest in the cabinet in terms of power. And it's the finance minister who has had all the power. And all of a sudden she finds herself, you know, really with, with, with a moment, with a window of opportunity. And if we in the health community, the global health community can't jump through this window now, show the case for increasing investment in health, you know, there are many nations that aren't even spending 1% of their GDP on health. If we can't make the case for greater budgetary allocation to health, if we can't make the case for raising new revenues from innovative sources, tobacco taxation, you know, taxing alcohol, uh, taxing carbon, there are many countries, as you know, that are spending more subsidizing dirty fossil fuels than they are spending on health and education combined. If we can't use this moment now for a realignment in terms of domestic resource mobilization for health, you know, when, when can we? When, you know, we have never got a better argument now for investing in health. Gotcha. Let me tell the audience that if you wanna start sending in questions, please go ahead and do that. I've got a question or two more for uh, Gavin and, 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 uh, and uh, Professor Schwartz. But let's stay, Gavin, let's stay with, with you. Um, I know that in time you recently wrote, and I want, I know you both want to get to the vaccination issue and, yeah. and you just wrote recently, though, not really referring to the problems with the vaccine distribution, but just saying, we can't rely on the vaccination, uh, of, uh, of people. And we, we can't wait, I think was what you said. Yes. Yeah. My piece was about the United States. Now, look, I think probably um, it won't shock anyone to know. I know it, this is a, a nonpartisan venue. It won't shock anyone to know that I am on the left of the spectrum politically. <laughs> I was excited at this change in administration. I've been very impressed with um, the competence of the new picks. The new CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, a friend of mine, we recently co-authored a piece on university reopening. I mean, there are some brilliant people and there are some amazing you know, innovations in policy already that are happening. I wish they had been bolder. I wish that this was not a country that seems to just accept and be numb to 
hundreds of thousands of daily cases, thousands of deaths every day. That has just become, I think, a, statistic, a sort of normalized statistics. Australia doesn't feel that way, nor does New Zealand or Taiwan or China or South Korea or Mongolia or Vietnam or Singapore. They don't accept the numbness of all this suffering and devastation. And there are things that the United States could be doing now. Vaccination rollout is slow. We are not going to get to vaccine herd immunity probably at quickest till the summer or the fall. Are we really happy to accept so much suffering, disability, disease and death day in, day out? I argued in my piece that that is really unacceptable and there are five things we can do now. One, we could get a high filtration mask to every single American. It wouldn't cost very much. We should all, all have N95 masks now. Why aren't we doing it? We need proper quality personal protective equipment for all essential workers, from doctors to physical therapists to teachers. We need to actually set up test, trace, isolate system. We've never done that. Uh, and I don't know why we've just sort of given up on that. We, I think, and I know this is not very popular, uh, and I've taken some flack for it, I think we should be instituting a circuit breaker to break the cycles of transmission. I think it was a big mistake from a policy point of view for Joe Biden very early on to take that off the table. You know, a short, sharp national stay at home order with massive financial support to people to do so. The UK obviously has had to do that, partly because of the new variant, the new variant that is likely to be dominant here uh, by March. These are all steps that we could be taking now um, because, you know, what are we waiting for? I mean, what, you know, the, the vaccine herd, herd immunity is not going to be for many months away. We simply cannot accept this level of suffering. Uh, Kathy, pick up the same question. Can, can we rely on, on an effective vaccination pro uh, distribution process? Is that possible? Is it a pipe dream? Where, where are we? Well, first of all, um, I think that the Biden administration has been in office for basically seven days and a few hours. And a lot of the problems that we are seeing right now are problems that they inherited and that the transition problems that did not have, you know, that prevented the Biden transition team from learning in far greater detail I think they learned almost nothing from the Trump administration about how many vaccines were in storage or were available, what the distribution plans were to get the stuff to the states. I mean, it was, it's a, that was a disaster. So to be where we are now, where this new administration has realized that one of the biggest problems was that the federal government would tell the states, maybe on Friday, maybe on Monday morning, how many would be shipped to them within the next 48 hours. And then, bon chance, you figure out how you are going to get that distributed and how many appointments should be made. So it's only in this last week that I think that we've started to see a much better um, plan going forward. And the fact that the federal government and, for example, here in North Carolina, Mandy Cohen has announced that we're going to know with three weeks advance. You can make much better planning whether or not you're going to have mass vaccinations places in a particular county or whether you're going to, how many will go to each of the other places that have been doing it for the last several weeks. Um, that said, I think that one of the things that Pfizer has done is to say, look, we promised 100 million doses. And now it turns out that those vials actually contain, if you have the right syringe, six doses, not five. So I think that we need to be, and I think that's what the Biden administration is doing, is saying, wait a minute. <laughs> if you could produce 100 million of those vials that would give us what you said before were 100 million doses, and now you're saying 120 million, you can do better than that. And I, I do think that we should expect this to go faster. The other thing that I think um, is very clear is that we don't have enough people to actually put 
the vaccine in people's arms. And at least over the last month, there has been much greater discussions like Gavin Newsom in California saying, okay, dentists can do this and allowing nursing students and other students to do this. Or people like me, once I get vaccinated, I could learn how to do this, or at least I could help out in the vaccination centers. And that I think would go a long ways towards speeding this up. The, the other thing, I would say two more things. One is that a lot of people who are frontline workers, people we've been you know, saying are heroes, they are essential workers. So I'm thinking about people who are nursing assistants in nursing homes or the people who do you know, what we call the environmental jobs that is cleaning up the rooms in hospitals after somebody has either died or left, but it's been a COVID room. Or you think about the people in the grocery stores that are doing the shopping for any of us. Um, they often are not getting paid anywhere near enough to support a family. And they, not surprisingly, have two jobs, maybe three jobs. So if somebody is going around saying, look, you should expect to have a sore arm and maybe be sick for 24 hours, or at least not feel up to snuff, who is going to then turn around and say, well, I can't go to my second job tomorrow, mm -hmm. even though that person is depending upon me or what, you know, I need that money. And I think we have not accounted for that enough. And so when you think back about what's the plan for vaccinating people, it would make a lot more sense to go neighborhood by neighborhood or, you know, some plan like that where it doesn't matter what your job is. This is your week. You may not feel well and your employer is going to have to know that that's what's happening. Um, without ever having to admit that you have another job or two other jobs. Um, and we're not thinking like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of what Gavin says, I agree with, but I also think that we need these very smart people, some of whom were my former colleagues or current colleagues, I have tremendous admiration for them, but we need to think about what it's like on the ground. And if people are not coming in even though we think they should because of these other aspects. I mean, maybe they don't trust an RNA vaccine. We all know that RNA itself is very fragile. It's not gonna stick around. It's not gonna do anything to our DNA. But this mistrust of science has left a lot of people saying, I don't want that. that we need to do more on that ground level of convincing people that it's perfectly safe vaccine. So I'll quit at that point. Good, good, no, that's great. I, you've really answered my last question, which was going to be about the Biden administration. I'm getting more than enough good questions coming in. So I'll, I'll go to both of you probably more in, in a lightning round, a little bit shorter, so we can try to get as many answers and then maybe give you both some time at the end to, to, to sum up. One question that we're getting is, I would summarize it by saying, how do we think about the, the, the money that's being spent here? Lots of money seems to be throwing around. There seems to be a, a lot of stories about waste and ineffectiveness. At the same time, we're hearing we got to have more money. We've got to have more resources. Is there a way to explain this to the public? You know, or is it just part of the the problem of 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 waste and need at the same time, Kathy? And sure. <laughs> well, I think one way to think about this is there's two kinds of money here. One is stimulus money to get the economy going again. And the other is relief money. And the relief money is for people who have lost their jobs or lost income and need money to be able to stay in their homes, to buy food, clothing for their kids. Um, and we need to sort of separate those two issues. Um, the second thing I would say is that if we are as a country so concerned about, and so here I'm speaking to political leaders in Congress, if we are so concerned about running up the US debt and the deficit every year, we should be repealing the tax cuts that happened in December, 2017, as fast as I can run around this block. That is just ridiculous to be saying, oh, we can't spend any more money because of rising debt. That's just not right. We have very low interest rates right now. And we are talking about a war-like situation. What Gavin said is absolutely right. We ought to be throwing money right now, both at 
controlling this pandemic and relief that people need. And it should be well targeted. And I think that um, we can certainly pay for this. It may take us five or 10 years of paying higher taxes to get this down, but there are too many children who are not in school. There are too many people who have lost their jobs. There are way too many people who have died because of this pandemic. And we can do that. There is no question. This is really, we're talking about our future children's lives. Oh, good. Kevin, Gavin, how do, but how do we handle, you were saying throwing, you didn't say throw money at it, but let's say if you are, we do need to throw money at this problem. Yes. So the, the waste that inevitably occurs, the, the ineffective. So, I mean, again, with a sort of global health lens, there's, uh, there's always two expressions when it comes to health financing globally or in global health, which is we need more money for the health, but we clearly also need more health for the money. So I think, you know, the suite of options that countries, low and middle income countries have on the table right now, of course, include trying to drive value for money, trying to find efficiencies, you know, adapting to sort of new delivery models, you know, using telemedicine, for example, task shifting, for example, engaging community health workers. These are all the sorts of strategies that are on the table. Of course, official development assistance, foreign aid right now in many countries is essential. Many of the world's most important donors, you know, have increased their aid. But the reality is that we can't, countries can't rely on that long term. You will have seen the appalling, shocking, horrific news out of the UK about the massive cuts to its aid budget, totally immoral. And I think that we may see other donors cutting their aid budgets in the future. So I think, you know, there's a range of measures that countries, you know, are having to go through, um, which is, yes, how can they mobilize more money externally, domestically? How can they drive efficiencies? And how can they also use this moment to kind of think about, you know, what kinds of new innovative delivery models are possible. Gotcha. And Matt, I'd Let like me... to add something more to this. You Go know, you asked, about, you asked about the waste part of this and inefficiencies. And I think um, after this last year where particularly the money that was intended to go to small businesses, and now there have been all these stories coming out of, you know, companies that seem to have so much money, why did they get any of this money? Why did some small restaurants not get it? Um, it those kinds of media uncovering of what is surely waste and um, one could argue that those that's money that um, was illegally obtained. And I think that it leads back to this trust in government problem that if you feel like, you know, I'm paying taxes and it's being spent in this way by companies that should not have gotten it. That's wrong. I mean, I, Gavin is right. This is immoral. And um, so when you think about what needs to be built back, it also is part of the federal government needs the people who can actually be in charge of how that money is dispersed. And part of that involves infrastructure again. I mean, the just getting these stimulus or relief checks out to people yeah. was poorly done. And part of that is computer problems. They're mm. antiquated computer systems. Gotcha. Ga Gavin, let me go to another question. I'm going to combine two and, and, and give them both to you. And Kathy might want to grab more of this, yeah. after this question. But well, I've got one question, especially interested in what you were talking about in terms of school openings. Yes. Larger qu related question is, how do we think about all the other needs besides attacking the COVID pandemic right now? Educational, economic. Um, sure, sure, uh, of course. Kevin so, I mean, it's a giant question, right? I think there is no development sector that has been unaffected. This, of course, has been a health crisis, but also an economic crisis, a food security crisis, an education crisis. I know I sound like a stock record. The best way to actually get on top is to control the pandemic, right? Schools have reopened in countries that were able to do so. And I, I'm sorry, I say, keep saying this, I cannot for the life of me understand why the US government, even the new, the new administration isn't saying, 
we need to just absolutely throw everything at this problem. I would like to see a massive effort to make schools safer, to make work safe, workplaces safer, you know, and there are a whole range of measures from ventilation to air filtration to pods to high filtration masks. Um, and, uh, you know, I always get pushback, as I've said before, you know, I would like to see a circuit breaker. I want to just push back on a myth that I don't know where it came from. Well, I do actually, it's, uh, you know, American Enterprise Institute, big business, big corporation, you know, that the public doesn't want protections. The public wants to be out there uh, working, that lockdowns, as they call them, circuit breakers, stay at home orders are unpopular. This is a myth. Public polling in the US and the UK has shown clearly people don't want to die. They do want protections. They are in support of taking, you know, aggressive measures to stop illness, disability, sickness and death, not long term. But if that's going to break the cycles of transmission, if it's going to reduce the intense pressure on health systems, if it's going to give time to make schools and workplaces safer, if it's going to give people time to set up test, trace, isolate support with massive financial support to stay at home, that is what I would well, that is what I would favor. I don't know why the US is being so timid. I know the administration is new, and as Kathy said, it's only been a week and so on. And we've all got friends and colleagues who have joined the administration. I'm rooting for them. I've been extraordinarily excited by so much of what they've done, including a massive focus on racial equity in the COVID-19 response. So there's a lot to love. I just wish there was you know, something bolder uh, in the face of, of the de daily devastation that we will continue to face until we can get on top of this pandemic. You know, I'm a massive fan of the notion that schools should be the last to close and the first to open. It has horrified me that North Carolina decided to put bars before schools. The bars here are packed with maskless people shouting, the schools are closed. Those are strange public priorities that we chose. Why are we not fixing that? Where is the urgency to do something about? I'm just finding the timidity very frustrating. You mean the schools are, are virtual? Uh, not, uh, they're, they're the schools are virtual. The schools are virtual. Yeah, right, yeah absolutely. Right. And, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, I have a son in Durham Public School, virtual. The teachers are really amazing. He's actually doing fine. Um, and I'm super lucky that, uh, you know, Duke's own nursery has remained open and he's had some part time nursery care. And again, you have to be very careful of N equals one studies and N equal one experiences. But they've done well at that nursery through all the measures that I mentioned earlier. The kids are masks. They're in pods. They're outdoors, rain or shine. They have HEPA filters in the classroom and they haven't had a lot of a lot of uh, transmission, a little, but not a lot. Um, it can be done. And why aren't we doing those sorts of investments in every single nursery and school nationwide urgently? The timidity, as you can tell, is really frustrating me. I mean, it keeps me up at night. Okay. Looks like I just want to prepare you all for kind of summary statements. At the end, we've got a lot of questions. Uh, Gavin, on the one hand about the international situation, how, what, what can we change in the status quo? Kathy, especially at the domestic situation, you've already kind of hit on this, but better coordination between federal, state, and local. So think about how you'll end by talking about what we can do in the future. One quick question. Uh, somebody has asked about, is there any way to make any immediate uh, improvement on the mask situation, any communication that now because Trump may be gone that we can communicate. I, as a former lawyer, I've told people that I would have advised a lot of the riders on Capitol Hill that they should have been wearing masks so that they couldn't have been uh, so easily arrested. But I can't think of any other good communication techniques. But do you think- so, chance Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. Firstly, Defense Production Act, Defense Production Act, Defense Production Act get everybody a high filtration mask. There's now multiple studies showing which masks actually are effective at filtering out the virus. You know, Austria is making high filtration masks 
They will be at cost in supermarkets. And if you're low income, they will be free. Taiwan, South Korea, they laugh at us. They've been doing this for a year. Why aren't we doing it? In the interim, all my friends and family and everyone who's been asking, I've been saying, get yourself a KN95, which you can get, put it underneath your cloth mask. You will have seen Pete Buttigieg and others double masking. And to Mitt Romney's credit, you see how bipartisan I am? I have really been impressed by a lot of, his, okay. of what he has done recently. Um, and that has included, you will have seen him uh, you know, on Capitol Hill, double masking early on. I think that, that is something we can all do today. Gotcha. Kathy, that anything- That blue Duke mask alone, not good enough. <laughs> all right, Kathy, anything specific on mask and then take it to, uh, to what do we need to specifically do what, what's your what's your five point plan if you have one or three point plan for the future? <laughs> um, well, I think I, I think what Gavin has said about masks, I will agree with, and I won't go further. Um, I think that this federal state coordination clearly has to take into account the differences that are there in all these different states and in all the different communities within states. Um, you know, there are people that are going to respond to different. Um, explanations, different arguments, whether you call them sweet arguments or like, here it is, this is what it is. Um, and we need to be realizing that, that we need to do all of that. Um, so if there are communities, for example, that don't trust the new vaccines because they are RNA based and they don't know what that means, but that sounds like it's fooling around with my DNA, we need much better explanations about that from people they will trust. And what we learned in West Virginia, for example, is that instead of relying on CVS and mm -hmm. Walgreens, C West Virginia from the get-go said, nope, we are gonna rely on our own pharmacies. And what it's turned out is that people trust the pharmacists they know, that they have always asked questions about pharmaceuticals before, and they have the highest percentage of people vaccinated Interesting. of the vaccines. Um, I, so I think that's clearly one, um, that you need to be very mindful of who are you talking to. Um, you know, I think another part of this is that uh, what I said before of being alert to the fact that people have more than one job and making that then how do you do this? So instead of thinking about, well, you have to make an appointment, you have to go online, you have to make a phone call. We've learned from I mean, if we've learned nothing else about opening it up to people 75 and older across the country, is that a lot of people who are 75 and older have older computers with different software and they are having the worst time trying to get online to get an appointment. And they are frantic now. That's not the way to be doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think that, uh, you know, realizing that we are not all the same across this country. Um, is, is really important. Um, and I heard the woman at Mass General Brigham System talking about how it was very different in terms of different employees within that huge 55,000 worker system of how they got them to come in and get vaccinated. So I'll tell you a little story. It turns out if you do a selfie showing them putting the vaccine and then you send that to all your friends, suddenly there were a whole bunch more of people who had worked with that person coming and say, okay, I will do it now. Gotcha. Thanks, Kathy. Gavin, in just a couple minutes, I think people, oh, yeah. I think people want you to uh, rebuild and reconstitute, recreate a new WH, uh, a World Health Organization. A lot of dissatisfaction with the status quo. What, what needs to happen internationally? after this? Um, so I think uh, the WHO performed pretty well, actually, in this pandemic. As I said, January 23rd, January 23, extraordinary clear guidance to countries as to what they should do. Um, and then a big divergence, whole bunch of countries listen, you know, um, uh, are clearly outward facing multilateral supporters. And the guidance from the WHO was, 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 was accepted, was, was acted on, and others didn't. We have had conversations about reforming the WHO for, for as long as the WHO has existed. Um, it's very easy to knock the WHO, of course, 
Um, in the end, we are the WHO, they are them and we are, are us. So it is a member state organization. So if we want the WHO to be different, that's on us. We need to fund the WHO rather than starve the beast as we have been doing year on year. We need to make sure the WHO has core funding for core functions like pandemic preparedness, knowledge generation and, 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 you know, and sharing. Sadly, the vast majority of the WHO's budget is for pet projects from donors, so-called extra budgetary funds. So we can't have it both ways. We can't say, oh, the WHO isn't doing its job and yet we starve it uh, of its job. Of course, there's going to be a continual ongoing reform process. Uh, I've, I've, you know, I've criticized the WHO in the past, you know, as often as the next uh, observer of global health, they were very slow on Ebola. Um, but I think actually their performance this time around has been better. If I have one more minute left to say, I would just say we have not talked about the global vaccine situation. We have right now vaccine apartheid. Um, everybody really is saying we are all very, very happy that this pandemic won't end until probably 2024. That is the policy decision we have made. Why? We don't end this pandemic until we have global vaccine herd immunity. And most lower middle income countries are not going to get there until 2023 or 2024 because of vaccine grabs by rich countries. That is an inequity that should keep us up at night. That is an inequity that we need to deal with. Not only, of course, is it true that an outbreak anywhere can become an outbreak everywhere. So if we don't actually start distributing vaccines worldwide, it's going to come back to haunt us. It's also economically appalling. You will have all seen this paper. The New York Times had it on its cover. We're going to have probably a nine trillion dollar economic loss from vaccine inequity. And half of that loss is going to be in the rich world because of our interconnectedness. We're not going to have countries to export to. We're not going to have the parts we need for machinery and so on. So every way you cut it, our behavior, the US has bought enough vaccine to vaccinate uh, its whole population four times over, Canada six times over, however you look at it, um, you know, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Thank you, Gavin. Well, this has met and exceeded my great expectations for, for this panel. Thank you so much to, to Kathy and Gavin. And uh, our great intern, Katherine Johnson, uh, wants me to note that before you go, please consider signing up for the POLIS newsletter to hear updates on similar events like this one. And then also to sign up if students are interested in our policy solution competition, which has a potential prize of $1,000 per person. So everyone should take a look at it. You can get it on chat. Uh, thank you again, uh, Gavin and Kathy. And let me hand it over back to Deandra. Thank you so much, Matt. Okay. Um, hope, hope everybody can hear me. Thank you so much. Cool. And I just want to give a few final thank yous um, to our special guests, as Max said, Professor Yemi, Professor Schwartz, uh, to our PhD fellow here at Paulus Marina Martinez. Thank you so much for organizing tonight's event. Uh, to Paulus's program coordinator, Anna Kinnear, and to our moderator, Professor Mac McCorkle. To all of the members of our audience, thanks so much for joining us. We hope to see you at our next Innovation Accelerator event, which will be held on Wednesday, February 10th from 6 to 7 p.m. So please stay tuned and you'll see announcements for that on our Twitter feed and the Polis website. Um, and we're going to hear from Stanford professors Lisa Janetian and Matt Johnson, who will talk about the ways that the pandemic has affected the gig economy, workers, parents, and more. So stay tuned and hope you have a great night.